Hello, my name is Marianne Dutschkevita at Marianne Did. You're watching Navarra Media at Navarra Media. Today, I am very excited to announce that this week, Navarra Media will host a special week of content of video games and politics. Now, I know that some of you may think that's a not choice. Surely there is Trump, the Labour Party, and the new objectivities to talk about. But hear me out. 2017 is the year when profits in gaming will overtake the film industry. Currently, as a cultural outlet, it holds the largest proportion of interaction with the populace. It is shocking, however, just how ignorant the left is about all this. No, more than ignorant, judgmental. The amount of times comrades roll their eyes at me when I confess to being a gamer. But this week, we invite you to give gaming a chance. The left's obsession with political utility has often proven to be a deterrent, very contradictory to the perceived project for freedom of choice as to how one passes their time. Discipline must be maintained when it's only allowed within certain circumscribed activities, think gardening, poetry, camping, raving. This monitoring of the individual's revolutionary function is extremely neoliberal. Initially imposed from the outside, it becomes internalized as the human subject gradually acquiesces to subtle regulations and expectations. There is nothing inherently freeing about physical exercise, for instance. It has to be framed in a certain way to be liberatory. By the same token, however, any discipline or activity can in theory become ethical work when approached with the right attitude. So really, what is it that differentiates some practices than that from others? Now, more than ever, it is counterproductive to ignore gaming, especially when such events as the election of President Donald Trump can be basically traced back to certain gaming communities. It's a $100 billion industry. The electronic sports scene is now bigger than ever before, filling stadiums of people and creating celebrities out of players. The finals of League of Legends tournament, for instance, were watched by 36 million people. That's 10 million more than the finals of NBA. Even Shaquille O'Neal has invested millions into esports lately. Yale University just recently delivered a study which shows that students who played a brain training video game for 20 minutes, three times a week, for four months, performed better on reading and math tests than their peers who did not. But most importantly, gaming is an art form. The rise of independent game studios in the last decade has truly transformed this cultural phenomena. The Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Barbican, the Victoria and Albert Museums here are all doing exhibitions just on gaming. The stereotype of the lone gamer in their parents' basement is false and needs to be left behind. These days, all cool kids game, Skepta and Paul Mason included. <laughs> Not that this medium is without its problems, of course. This week's content will focus heavily on the many awful industry practices involved in gaming, from the condition of workers producing the actual consoles, to the people developing games, and even the teams professionally playing them. It's no secret that in order to enjoy playing video games, one relies on gadgets made in increasingly brutal conditions. Indeed, that is the one and only legitimate criticism I accept when it comes to the activity of gaming. However, even here there is exciting potential to escape from the tyranny of the games console. More and more devices are created with modular functions and it is not unreasonable to imagine a company like Valve, for instance, investing in ethically sourced games console. Manufacturers, developers and players are all unionizing and demanding better work conditions. Now, there is an entire school of thought that attempts to defend video games politically simply as a medium encouraging an act of play, an activity that technically cannot be co-opted. Game structures can develop feelings of participation in decisions, belonging to a group and plays, purposeful effort, achievement by effort, competence and abilities, confidence in a role, recognition of contribution, respect from peers, respect for peers, autonomy and engagement. Gaming holds the potential to teach, train, help provide and share tools to destabilize the status quo, both implicitly and explicitly. But these very same qualities also have a potential to trap the player within game spaces that are less about create powers of play and more about soothing citizens' anxieties within sanctioned commercial leisure spaces. Play may offer 
a sense of order and control, moment of recuperation and escape from the insecurity, inequality and tension caused by capitalist systems. But in the current political state, it is impossible to divorce even something as innocent as play from contemporary modes of production. But then the same can be said about pretty much all other cultural mediums, whether that's film, fine art, music. This week, we will be covering gaming from a multitude of perspectives. We will be talking all things video games and mental health, unions, the grime scene, liberal feminism, Trump, Brexit, ethics, aesthetics, you name it. No matter whether you're a hardcore gamer or just play Candy Crush on your phone, we promise you will find something of interest. Too much time has been wasted pandering to dogmas. Solidarity, cooperation, self-organization, creation and autonomy need to be expressed in a vast diversity of tactics. These are the only agents in our battle against the complete privatization of existence. One may find these mechanics in the most unexpected of places and most certainly in gaming. Remember, boredom is always counter-revolutionary. <laughs> This is Maria Andrzej Garita for Navarra Media, and I hope you enjoyed this week's content. Thanks for watching.